The purpose of the Book Talk series is to stimulate dialogue among our faculty and graduate students within the College of Education and an interdisciplinary dialogue among colleagues across campus about, about ways to increase the academic achievement of students of color, help all students develop positive attitudes, and, and become effective citizens of a democratic society, and to learn about the histories and cultures of various racial, ethnic, and cultural groups in the U.S. and around the world. One of our book talks focused on uh, Audrey, uh, some of them, we're not limited to the United States. Some of our work focuses on countries around the world. Procedure. Professor Williamson will speak for about 45 to 50 minutes. We will then invite your participation in a Q&A dialogue, and after that she'll sign copies of her book. It is a, a great pleasure for me to introduce my colleague and cherished colleague, Professor Joy Williamson. Professor Williamson is an Associate Professor of Educational Leadership and Policy Studies. She joined our faculty last fall. She had been at the, at, on the faculty at Stanford University, and we feel we pulled off quite a coup uh, when we brought her here. She was a student of my colleague and friend, Jane Anderson at the University of Illinois, Champaign-Urbana. Professor Williamson's primary research agenda examines the reciprocal relationship between social movements, particularly those of the middle 20th century and institutions of higher education. Her previous work investigated black student motivated reform at predominantly white institutions during the black power era. Her book, Black Power on Campus, the University of Illinois, 1965 to 75, examined the interaction between students and administrators that created these successful support systems which exists on today's college campuses. And I didn't realize it would be here, but it's also back there for signing. Um, her book, uh, the focus of the book talk today is her latest book, Radicalizing the Ebony Tower, Black Colleges and the Black Freedom Struggle in Mississippi. This path-breaking book examines black colleges in Mississippi during the civil rights and black power movement. It offers a unique opportunity to understand how institutions are transformed into liberatory agents. Professor Williamson examines how campus constituents negotiated and clashed over local, state, and national pressures against the backdrop of the highly contentious conflict between those determined to protect racial hierarchy and others equally determined to cripple white supremacy. She shows how students challenge the notion of the university as an hour tower distant from community affairs and documents how colleges tried to resolve the tension between activism and academics. Through the words and deeds of actual participants, this moving account provides first-hand knowledge of how students balance their pursuit of higher education with campus and societal reform. Dr. Williamson teaches courses on the history of education, the history of higher education, education as a moral endeavor, the shifting definitions of proper education and liberation for different social groups, and the educational histories of people of color. She also teaches in the secondary teacher education program. In addition to two important books, Professor Williamson has written a number of articles in pre prestigious and refereed publications, including the History of Education Quarterly, the Journal of Negro Education, and the Review of Research in Education. It is my distinct pleasure to introduce my colleague and friend, Professor Joy Williamson. Thank you. I love the way he talks about me. <laughs> he does it in faculty meetings, he does it here, it's phenomenal. I wanna thank you, uh, James Banks, for inviting me to give this talk here. I am um, grateful for the opportunity. And also, I thank all of you for coming. I know that all of you are very busy, and I appreciate you carving time out of your busy schedules. Prefer the mic? Okay, that means I have to stand here. I can't move, but that's okay. <laughs> but again, I appreciate that you uh, have made the time in your schedules to come and listen to me talk about my baby that's finally been birthed. Just came out last month. So the name, the title of the book, Radicalizing the Ebony Tower, Black Colleges and the Black Freedom Struggle in Mississippi, 
What I'm going to do today is give you a general overview of the uh, mission of the book and then some examples to illustrate how I achieve the mission and, um, and with some conclusions that I drew from the book. So where I'd like to start, when I started doing, so my first book examined black students at predominantly white institutions and so I'd been reading about this around this era uh, for some time and I realized as I was reading that there were uh, several gaps in the literature. And so where I'd like to start is to con discuss the traditional story of uh, campus constituent involvement in the movement because it'll give you uh, an eye into the revisionist treatment that I provide in my uh, current book. So I have four main critiques of the existing literature, the traditional story of college involvement in the movement. The first is that the literature often if not always, divorces these campus constituents from their campus context. And so whether it's the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee or discussions of student activism, they're talked about as if they were activists first and students second. But it's important to remember that these students went to college to get a degree so they could get a well-paying job not to become activists. You didn't have to go to college to be an activist. And so to divorce them from their campus reality uh, is unfortunate and it, and it also uh, skews the way that we can understand them in the student movement writ large. My second major critique is that the existing literature uh, employs a structuralist type of, um, of an explanation. So the black college played an important role in the black freedom struggle. I don't believe that the black college existed. Uh, that there were, there were a variety of ways that institutions intersected with the movement, a variety of pressures that they were under. And so this, um, to treat the colleges as identical, incorrectly credits structures with precipitating activism. And I don't believe that mere attendance at a black college was enough to precipitate activism, that we have to look for some other reasoning. My third critique is that the, the literature really does overplay the protected status of campus constituents. Um, the, um, most of the literature says that, uh, particularly for students, was their youthful um, energy, idealism, uh, they were, you know, so this, um, they're on a college campus, they uh, are free of family obligations, of work obligations, and in a lot of ways that literature is correct, that these are, these are important factors. But the problem with discussing it this way is that the counter movement that campus constituents faced is completely ignored. Students faced the threat of expulsion and suspension. Faculty and staff and administrators faced the threat of uh, being suspended or fired. And the billy clubs carried by police didn't know the difference between students and non-students. And so participation was not an inevitable outcome of college campus constituency. It was an act of will. And we have to understand it as such. Lastly, a lot of work on whether it's students and the student movement or just this period in general creates this dividing line between the civil rights movement and the black power movement. And the same is done in, uh, with regard to students. And so when people examine Southern black student activism, they stop talking about Southern black students in 1964. And then the later 1960s is when people focus on black students in the North at predominantly white institutions. And so black college students in the South completely drop out of any examination of what happens in the later 1960s. And this is despite the fact that quantitative studies found that black students at black colleges were highly active and they faced the most punitive form of punishment with regard to any student, any other type of student at any other type of campus. So they were highly active and very important and being slammed in a variety of ways, yet they're ignored in the literature. One of the results of this is that um, when people talk about the student movement, they focus on the University of California at Berkeley and the free speech movement there in 1964 as the launching of student activism. Well, if that's only possible because these black students in the early 1960s are stripped of their student status. When you examine, examine them as activists, they're not allowed to be students, and so they do not fit into the story of student activism, which uh, is pro highly problematic. So these are my four main critiques of the literature. And so then what I seek to do, I have three kind of overarching master goals for the book. The first is to examine how campus constituents appropriated the college campus, how they sometimes successfully appropriated the college campus as a movement center and sometimes were not successful uh, in that endeavor. Because again, I don't accept that it is 
it was inevitable that they would participate. So I actually want to look at, well, how did they do it? Why did they do it? And when uh, were they successful? Or why weren't they successful? Second, I examine the variability across campuses. And so I, this is breaking down the the black college category. And so uh, what often happens in the literature is that um, private campuses are portrayed as completely immune from state pressure, and public campuses are portrayed as completely prone. And there was something unique about being a private institution with private funding in the South and in Mississippi in particular. But private institutions participated in a variety of ways. And some of them might as well have been a public institution in their attitude toward the movement and that they were expelling students left and right as well as faculty left and right. And with public institutions, there were some that were highly, more highly active than others. And so again, it's really kind of looking at the variability across campuses to understand how I was really interested in how institutions can protect themselves from a variety of different pressures and how they choose to perform that. And then lastly, I uh, examined the, um, and discussed the continuity and longevity of the black freedom struggle. And so I examined black power in a Mississippi context on the black colleges there. So this is, again, the master narrative for the book. I'm going to offer you some examples of how I achieve these ends. And I'm going to be focusing on the first and the third here. So talking about how campus constituents appropriated the campus space, as well as the continuity and longevity of the uh, black freedom struggle. So first, I'm actually going to talk about both student appropriation of the college campus as well as faculty activism, because also faculty activism is virtually um, absent in discussions of college campuses that all focuses on students, which students were the most important campus constituency, but faculty weren't absent. So first, student government associations. They have an interesting history on black college campuses. They have an interesting history, period. But they were devised, Thomas Jefferson was the the first, I believe, proponent of student governments. He said we should um, give students a measure of power so they can practice democracy in a real way. So it was a way of, uh, it, this is a very Jeffersonian idea, kind of a uh, distributed democracy. On black college campuses in the 1950s, uh, I'll be talking about 1957 in particular, they were supposed to be restricted to particular parts of campus and were supposed to have only particular kinds of input. So at Alcorn A&M College, which is a public institution in Mississippi, that means that it was completely black in its constituency, but completely white controlled. The Board of Trustees was completely white and racist. One of them actually says in 1969, I've been reading this definition of racist and I say, yeah, that's me. So. When I say racist, they are admitted racist. I'm not, I'm not creating, I'm not pulling that out of the air. This is, they say this in print. Uh, they control the purse strings. They also control the presidents of these public institutions in, a, in, um, in large measure. And so that, you have to understand that to understand uh, Alcorn. So in 1957, a professor at Alcorn who was black, of course, his name was Clennon King, writes a series of articles in, that are published in the State Times, which is a white Mississippi newspaper that was known for its racism. And in his articles, he says the NAACP, he associates the NAACP with communism. He says that Adam Clayton Powell, who was a giant in the movement, was a dupe to, this is a quote, dupe to northern race trickery. He provides a thoroughly cleansed interpretation of American slavery and uh, he expresses his admiration for the character Uncle Tom in Uncle Tom's Cabin. And if you've ever read Uncle Tom's Cabin, you can imagine that in 1957, this didn't go over very well. <laughs> uh, so he's publishing this series in the State Times. The problem comes into play, and this is where the student government enters the picture. The paper includes photos of Alcorn students next to the articles. So this makes it appear that Alcorn students condone what he is saying in his articles. The students are furious about it, and they actually call for a boycott of his classes. I'm going to start a video here. I actually have a video from 1957. Hard to find, but this is actually, you're going to see the Student Government Association president uh, addressing the media. I'm going to start playing it because the audio comes in a little bit later. So this is, um, oops, let's go back.
So this is all, this is all corn, and eventually you're going to see the students um, near the chapel, and then you're going to hear the audio kick in. So the students start a boycott of his classes. Then the boycott spreads to all classes on the Alcorn campus the following day. This is the chapel. The students call a rally at the chapel, and Professor King goes to address them to try and persuade them to go back to camp, go back to class. They absolutely refuse. And the, you'll see Doris McEwen, who's here at the University of Washington. This is her father. He was the president of the Student Government Association. He's going to read a statement that was signed by 489 of the 571 Alcorn students. Let's see. There we go. Let me see if I can start it over for you. We feel that every man is entitled to express his opinion because each person has freedom of speech, the press, but we believe that it is unprofessional and unethical for any person to prescribe or use another's name, picture, or institution in support of his convictions. The student body was not informed of this submission of this article to the state term. Therefore, we were denied our freedom of speech. There is an apology owed to us by Mr. King. The only circumstances under which we will accept this apology is by the offer of his resignation. The damage that has been done to us by Mr. King cannot be repaired without a blemish. We do not wish under any circumstance to have Mr. King remain on our campus. That should give you a brief summary of the event that occurred today. At 11.55 a.m., the oldest land grant college in America, the Negroes, which was founded in 1871, died. So I'm going to let it continue to play. So the fact that the, these students used the Student Government Association, so they appropriated the student um, organization for these political types of aims, infuriated the Board of Trustees, as you can imagine. The result was that the Board of Trustees expelled every single one of the students at Alcorn, every single one of the students. So when I talk about this in some of my classes, I'll say, so imagine all of you were sent home. And Alcorn is in a very isolated location. You can't just hear, you can walk to your dorm, or you can walk to some other place. It's seven miles away from any infrastructure. There's no stores, there's no gas stations, there's nothing around the campus. They expel all of the students, and they fire the president because they suspect him of collusion with the students. And if the students want to re-enroll, Ernest McEwen was not allowed to re-enroll. The ringleaders, the Student Government Association, were not allowed to re-enroll. They had to transfer to other institutions outside of the state of Mississippi because um, in-state public institutions wouldn't have them. And they actually ended up at private institutions out of state because that's the only places that would have them. Uh, the students who did want to re-enroll had to meet with the new president, who had obviously been handpicked by the board, and sign a statement promising that they would not participate in any other activism while they were students. Most did, most did, and re-enrolled, but they were furious. And this actually, so this beginning of this new president's tenure starts out rocky. It remains rocky through his entire uh, tenure at the, at the campus. Uh, he uh, was a willing puppet of the Board of Trustees. Not all, when you were a public, pre public college president, a black college president, there was, uh, you had, I mean, and you, you call, your college needed money. There were certain things that you had to do. But some presidents went further than others, and the new president at Alcorn um, did everything in his power to appease the Board of Trustees. So this is uh, students appropriating the Student Government Association. It, it wasn't that the trustees didn't want discussions of citizenship to be a part of what happened at Alcorn. It was a part of Alcorn's charter, but the discussions were to be just that, discussions. They weren't supposed to enact citizenship in this kind of way um, on or off the college campus. So faculty were also um, active, less so than students, but they were also active. Let me give you a couple examples. One is Tougaloo from Tougaloo College. Tougaloo was the 
one of the most radical institutions in the state in that it had a, it, it's private, and it had uh, a white president, a lot of white faculty. Almost all of the students were black. All of the students had been black until the early 1960s when Alcorn's reputation uh, enticed transfer students, white transfer students from different uh, institutions really in the Northeast to come down and spend a year at Alcorn. So that desegregates the student body, which means that Tougaloo is the only voluntarily desegregated student body in the state in the early 1960s. So it's a very radical space. Mississippi Valley State University is a public institution, which means that its constituency is all black, but the Board of Trustees is all white. So they're different uh, types of institutions. So with Tougaloo, this photo, I, I wanted to move over here and point, but I'm not sure if you'll be able to hear me. <laughs> uh, this is the famous Woolworths, well, a version of the famous Woolworths sit-in in 1963. Uh, the white woman is a transfer student. Her name's Joan Trumpauer. The woman next to her, covered, they're all covered in mustard, ketchup, salt, sugar. The, woman, the black woman next to her is Ann Moody, who authored Coming of Age in Mississippi. This white man who's sitting down, he's covered in ketchup and mustard. He's also covered in blood. This is John Salter. He was a professor of political science at Tougaloo, uh, who had been beaten and, and forced his way back to the counter to sit, to desegregate the lunch counter at Woolworths. The man standing over him is Ed King, who was the chaplain at Tougaloo, who came once word of the sit-in, uh, what, ha what was happening at the sit-in. He drives downtown to basically to uh, provide a car for uh, escape for the sit-in participants. And if you see this, the white man at the very top of the screen, that's the president. Once he hears what's happening at Woolworths, he goes, he sits at the lunch counter and demands police protection for his campus constituents. So this is both an example of heroism, really, as well as um, brutal response. So this is, these are faculty and students and staff being highly active, but meeting a um, se severe, meeting severe repercussions from it. But just to give you, so Alcorn was radical, but there are some conservatives at, at uh, Tougaloo also. There was a man who was a professor of, um, a white man who was a professor of philosophy and, re and religion, I believe. And um, he's working with the state to try and, he doesn't like the mix of activism and academics. And so he's working with the state uh, to help to, uh, actually to get the president fired. And actually they do succeed at that. That's not what I'm gonna be talking about in my talk today, but if you wanna hear more about why uh, Pr President Biden was fired. I certainly can talk about it during the questions and answers. So this professor who was working with the state, this is a quote from one of the letters he wrote to um, a member of the state. I'm in favor of the Negro having every right that he can obtain, but I do not believe it to be the purpose of Tougaloo College to sponsor agitation. So he says, activism and academics shouldn't mix. Fire everybody who's allowing this to happen. Because President Biden did not fire these faculty, nor did he expel the students where you just saw, heard at Alcorn, that's exactly what was happening there, what was happening there. So at Mississippi Valley State College, even the whiff of support for the movement uh, brought retribution from the state. The, I'm gonna back up a little bit. So James Meredith was the first black person admitted to the University of Mississippi. That happens in 1962. It happens only after federal intervention through a variety of court cases. Uh, the accrediting agency that accredited institutions in the South revoked cr accreditation from um, the University of Mississippi. This is, means that your students, they, basically their, their degrees are useless. And also the AAUP, the American Association of University Professors, puts the university um, on, cens on its censure list. So there's a, my, there's a variety of pressures on the Board of Trustees to admit James Meredith, to, and it works. The AAUP's role here is less important than the federal role and the accreditation role because all the AAUP can do is publicly humiliate an institution. Censure really doesn't mean anything. It's just public humiliation for your institution. And for a state that was willing to <laughs> endure public humiliation for the sake of the racial hierarchy, the AAUP really did not carry a big stick, is the point. But still, in 1962, the board devises a tenure policy that uh, resembles what the, A the AUP has um, asked 
four and um, in, in their 1940s statement about academic freedom and tenure. And so the, the Mississippi board says, all right, if we're going to fire a faculty member, we're going to give them a hearing, so that's due process, and we're going to allow them three months notice. Because actually they had fired a, a professor who was actually a historian. He'd been working there for 36 years. Full professor fired him for publishing a book uh, that was negative towards Mississippi. So they fire him and then they, then they create the, the, the policy because he's already gone. So this policy exists, it's created in 1962. In 1964 at Mississippi Valley State College, the president fires several faculty in direct violation of the 1962 policy. They are not given a hearing and they're not given three months notice. One of the fire faculty, his name was Paul Taylor, Professor Taylor was a member of the AAUP. So the president listed contumacious conduct as his reason for uh, firing uh, Professor Taylor and these other faculty, but they suspected that their membership in the AAUP was the real reason. There was no AAUP chapter, but there were individual members of the AAUP, and so they suspected that it was their membership that was the actual root of the problem. Because remember, so this is 1962. They've been, or 1964 at Mississippi Valley State. They've been battling the AUP. It, 1962 was only the most recent salvo in their long running war, uh, the state of Mississippi versus the AAUP. And, and actually, the uh, chairman of the Board of Trustees actually admitted as much. Um, that the problem was actually the AAUP in his conversation with the fired faculty. He literally says, your trouble is the AAUP. <laughs> uh, and so there are letters, the AAUP, so they also tell Professor Taylor, do not pursue your complaint. The board warns him, do not pursue your complaint. He defies them and pursues his complaint and files a formal complaint with the national office of the AAUP. And so now there are a set of letters, which I was able to get, between the AAUP and the Board of Trustees, writing back and forth to each other. Because the, so the AAUP goes to campus, uh, has a full investigation, and is horrified by the conditions that they find. And this is uh, an excerpt from the letter. If the administrators are permitted to flout the regulations which affect themselves, is not the reaction among faculty members and students likely to be one of cynical disregard, if not contempt? for an authority which expects more of them than it does of themselves. So these are very strong words. See, this is the AUP writing to the uh, Board of Trustees about the President as well as the Board of Trustees. So the Board of Trustees writes back to the AUP, and this is a quote. The Board of Trustees has not vi uh, authorized these violations by the President, but has come to the conclusion that the welfare of the institution requires that the actions of the President should be sustained in these instances. Negro, the situation at the Negro colleges in Mississippi is very different from the situation in the white colleges. If early notice was given, the new militant spirit among the Negroes would, likely to, would be likely to arouse the students to rebellion, and late notice was therefore a safeguard against, against such student action. So here they're saying, yes, he violated our two-year-old policy, but we believe he did so um, uh, in an appropriate way, because this way we get around what might, uh, might, might happen, student activism on campus. So this is an incredibly twisted kind of logic. It's, it, it is absolving this president of violating board policy for very twisted, racist reasons, very typical of Mississippi at the time. So there are more letters back and forth, but the, the Board of Trustees refuses to budge, completely refuses to budge. And they actually write a letter to Paul Taylor saying, um, basically that there's little they can do, and quote, the president, sin, th there's little they can do since, quote, the president of the school remained insensitive to such acts, action and was supported by his board. So here the AAUP is completely toothless. They do put Alcorn on censure. Actually, they re-censure Alcorn. It had been censured previously. Censure is, this is 1964. Censure is not lifted from Alcorn until 1973. This is how little the board of trustees cared about its public black colleges in the state. So now, jumping forward a bit, black power Mississippi style. It's different in Mississippi. So try as the white power structure might, Mississippi did not escape the black power movement. In fact, the racial reality in the state fed it. In, so James Meredith, who was the first black man to enroll, black person to enroll at the University of Mississippi, in June of 1966, 
he decides he's going to go on what he calls a march against fear, and he's going to walk through the state to demonstrate that a black man can walk through the state of Mississippi safely. And he starts at the northern border, and he's going to walk to Jackson. On the second day of the march, he's shot. This is a picture of him hitting the ground right after he's been shot. This shocks the nation, but it has a particular impact in Mississippi. He was a local hero, and now he's been shot. This changes things as far as a lot of, not every black Mississippian, but as far as a lot of black Mississippians are concerned. Joyce Ladner, who is now, uh, she's retired, but she uh, was a respected sociologist, um, who had, she'd actually been a student at Tougaloo, and she, she uh, is, I'm reading, I'm going to be reading from a piece that she wrote when she was a graduate student, so it's interesting for me to, I've talked to her now, she's a retired, respected sociologist, and now I'm reading something from her graduate school days. Uh, but she talks about what this means for blacks in Mississippi, and so this is a quote from her. Since many of the effort, and this was a quote that she wrote at the time, since many of the efforts Mississippi Negroes made to change the social structure through integration were futile, they began to reconceptualize their fight for equality from a different perspective, one designed to acquire long sought goals through building bases of power. The Black Power Movement concept was successfully communicated to Mississippi Negroes because of the failure of integration, but it was also communicated to them by the shooting of James Meredith on his march through Mississippi. This act of violence made Negro activists feel justified in calling for audacious black power. For only with black power, they contended, would black people be able to prevent events like the shooting. So th this had a huge impact on Mississippi. And so one of the reasons I find it so disturbing that the South is left out of the black power conversation is that black power was born in the state of Mississippi. James Meredith is shot, but several organizations, the NAACP, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, the Congress of Racial Equality, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, all of these organizations converge on Mississippi to finish his march. And it is on that second leg of the march that Stokely Carmichael makes this call for black power and it catches fire. So the black power movement is born in the South, even though the South is completely written out of the black power movement. So adding, as an aside, adding insult to literal injury, the white press twists this uh, event. They say it was manufactured. Uh, there's actually a cartoon. I haven't been, I can't track it down in my thousands and thousands of documents, but there's a cartoon of um, Dr. Martin Luther King with the byline that says, my, an, an incident, an incident, my kingdom for an incident. So they say, well, you know, this is kind of, this is pr produced by the NAACP and these other rights organizations. And so this, as you can imagine, adds fuel to the fire of how um, blacks are, how the, the, um, the racial animosity that existed in the state. Let's give you a context. So black power at the University of Mississippi. It's an interesting place, uh, interesting history. So it, it actually, James Meredith shooting in 1966, remember he'd been a student at Ole Miss. The few black students that were there in 1966 um, didn't even know how to express their anger. There were so few of them, and that tried, it was interesting to talk to them, thinking about, well, you know, what do we do? This is our hero, our, our predecessor, and, but we feel that there's literally nothing we can do about it. But by 1970, there are 200 black students on the University of Mississippi campus. This is undergrad and grad together. It's a huge jump from one in 1962, but there's still only 2.5% of the population. And considering the state is about 45% black, still minuscule. So in 1970, black students under the banner of the newly formed Black Student Union devise a set of demands and try and present those demands to the chancellor, who was the highest ranking um, administrator on campus. And the demands um, ranged from uh, black studies to the reduction of racist incidents occurring on campus. And so they try and present these grievances to the chancellor and are turned away. They, they, did, they, they, then, they decide to turn away from trying to present their grievances to the chancellor to direct action tactics, to actually perform something. And so there's uh, a traveling concert at the time called Up With People and they're at the University of Mississippi. And there, there's a concert um, on the campus. And depending on the sources you read, they either stormed the stage or they were invited up on the stage. <laughs> it's 
depending on your source. Uh, I believe the, they were invited up on the stage because I've talked to people who were both, well, the, the, the storming the stage was from the white press, which you can never trust when it came to talking about black people in Mississippi. Uh, and I talked to people who were actually involved, who were there um, at the time. So they, they end up on the stage and um, commandeer a microphone, or are given a microphone again, depending on who you believe. 69 students do this. All of them are arrested. So there's, now there's a difference here between university sanction and criminal charges. Not only were they facing university um, punitive action, they were facing criminal charges. So 69 of them are arrested. Within 48 hours, 28 more students are arrested um, outside. A, they were having a picket demonstration outside the chancellor's home. So this is almost half the black student body at the University of Mississippi has been arrested. To give you, uh, I have a couple photos that I want to show to you to put you in the mood. This is an Ole Miss football game. This is it's 1965, and I'm talking about 1970, but it could easily be 1970. This was the atmosphere in which these black students existed. This is actually a photo of the students on the stage. So as it says here, um, 200 students formed the Black Student Union, tried to uh, have their concerns heard. This, these, it says eight students um, were suspended as a result. So the, the back story behind this, before you get to that end point, the campus, this throws the campus, I mean the campus had never been, racial tension had never been absent on the campus, but this escalates it. And now the whole campus is debating what should happen to these students. So you have some administrators saying, we should drop the criminal charges against them. You have other administrators saying, do not drop those criminal charges because we do not want the University of Mississippi to go the way of Duke or Columbia or Cornell, where these students are armed and are taking over uh, campus buildings. They say, we need to make uh, an example of these students. You have white students debating what should happen to these black students. You have a few liberal white students on campus in a club called the Young Democrats Club who are trying to figure out ways of um, racial reconciliation. And you have other white students publishing inflammatory rhetoric in an underground newspaper that was called the Rebel Underground, which was actually sponsored by the White Citizens Council, which was the gentleman's version of the KKK. He just wore a suit instead of a hood. Uh, and so the students are debating it, the white students are debating it. You also have the, the uh, campus chapter of the AAUP debating what should happen to the students. And this is, they're all, this is all being published in the student um, newspapers and other sources. This is where I got this information. And so the AAUP criticizes the black students for some of their behavior, but they argue that the criminal charges should be dropped. And they condemn the institution, quote, for its general indifference to the well-being of the black student at this university who are treated as an unwelcomed guest. So the AAUP steps in. The, actually, the, the, the lieutenant governor registers his opinion on uh, what should happen to these black students as well. It's mostly because he's going to be trying to run for governor the following year. It's literally, I mean, he kind of throw, it's all about law and order. This is 1970. It's kind of what's happening in the nation in general. Uh, he doesn't win the governorship, but he tries, he tries to use this situation as fodder for his uh, gubernatorial run. And so at the end, of the, the students were granted hearings, and they actually were granted lawyers. This was a huge advance um, in student rights. And in the end, only eight students were not allowed to re-enroll for a year, and then they were allowed to re-enroll after that. The other students, remember there were several, almost 100 students who arrested, only eight. Uh, the others were allowed to re-enroll immediately after the hearings. So was it a success? I get asked this whether it was, uh, well, since I study uh, student activism, I always ask, well, did it work? Was it a success? Well, it depends on your measures of success. Uh, Tougaloo College has a black studies program, or minor. The University of Mississippi has a black studies program, not a department. A department and a program are different. Uh, none of the other campuses do white or black, but all of the campuses have at least one black-oriented course on the books. There are now black trustees on the board of trustees. Uh, students continue to uh, at least attempt to uh, co-opt the campus space as a movement center and they continue to be involved in on-campus as well as off-campus organizations toward that end. So student interest in social activism has not ended, thank goodness. Uh, black students 
helped to fortify First and Fourteenth Amendment rights for all students. It wasn't just black students who did this, but they helped to participate in guaranteeing the right of freedom of speech as well as due process on college campuses. And so this was, a, this was students today have to thank the students of the past for not, I mean, they could have, I mean, remember, the expulsions were happening on a regular basis. And the, the spirit of the movement, the, the success of the movement is found in less quantifiable ways as well in the psychological and cultural boost that the black community received from this black uh, freedom struggle era, not just the black power era, but the black freedom struggle era writ large. I have a quote here from a historian talking about the 60s in general, but this applies uh, very well to black students as well. Uh, by decolonizing their minds, cultivating, fe cultivating feelings of racial solidarity, and contrasting their world with that of the oppressor, Black Americans came to understand themselves better. In developing a greater pride in blackness than had any generation before them, the 60s activists discovered a deep well of untapped energy which enabled ordinary people to do extraordinary things. And it is that, that, that sense, that ethos, that is a legacy of this uh, period in time and that uh, a lot of black students are the benefactors of. They have received the, the benefits of this and they are participating in it in a variety of ways currently. So my focus on campus constituents isn't meant to convey that they were the only participants in the black freedom struggle. They weren't. But they were pivotal in the, uh, in the black freedom struggle. They forced society to think more deeply about the purpose of a college education and the end to which students should be educated, which are questions I think are worthy of discussion in the contemporary context. And by envisioning the, the campus climate as a fertile environment, for racial uplift, for um, social activism, and for the pursuit of democracy. They actually invig they invigorated the educative enterprise in very important ways. And I have a quote here from Du Bois, one of my favorite people of all time. The opposition to Negro education in the South was at first bitter and showed itself in ashes, insult, and blood. For the South believed an educated Negro to be a dangerous Negro, and the South was not wholly wrong. For education among all kinds of men always has had and always will have an element of danger and revolution, of dissatisfaction and discontent. Black college constituents and the white power structure in Mississippi well understood the dangers of which Du Bois spoke. Not only did re education raise the, the hopes and expectations of the black community, the black activists using their campuses as weapons against the racial hierarchy help to ampli amplify and make real the concept of education for liberation. So I will stop there and invite any questions. <laughs> yes. 